Welcome to Wide Awake Stories from Insomniac. This is a journey by a journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new value, and a new experience. <laughs> Broadcasting from the Insomniac HQ, this is Wide Awake Stories. Hey everybody and welcome to episode 16 of Wide Awake Stories, the newer, improved, younger version of Wide Awake Stories. <laughs> <laughs> no, in all seriousness, we did get a comment on our last show from a listener who thought that we were maybe keeling on the on the bit of the old side of things. So uh, we've got a fresh, new, younger episode for everyone today. Um, my 10-year-old son is in the studio, <laughs> his three friends are in the studio, and Ray Sremmerd are in the studio. No, but in all seriousness, we have Deirdre here to my left. Hello. Mr. Ross Gardner across the way. Hello. And the Oracle Sam Yu is in the building. What's good? How's everyone been since last we hung out together in the studio? Yeah, can't complain. Yeah, you uh, had a nice little appearance at a recent Insomniac gathering. Did you not want to tell I us did, about that? I did indeed. That was fun. So you flexed your uh, talents at the turntables. <laughs> I don't know if I would call it that. I did play some some tunes downstairs in our Insomniac office. The video team has a really lovely decked out space. I played from six to seven. And then after me, it was Quintino. After Quintino, it was Gigantor. Yeah, from um, Evil Intent. Yeah. Yeah, we it's like our own little boiler room thing that we've got going on down there. Absolutely. Yeah, it's about time. I mean, we should have been doing it ages ago, so I'm glad that we're doing it now. It's on every Friday evening, starting at 6 p.m. Pacific time. It's streamed on Facebook Live, and it's called The Weekend Starts Here, fittingly. So tune into our Insomniac Events Facebook page. That's where it's streaming starting at 6 o'clock. It's fun. Yeah, it's a good vibe down there. You got to come down, Ross. I'd love to, man. When you get your DJ collective. Yeah, uh, my little DJ crew. Yeah, what's that all about? Yeah, I've been playing in the bedroom like a sort of sad boy for (laughs) a couple of years now. And I'm like ready to just sort of make my way out. And I found another few people that have been sad boying it up in their bedrooms too. So (laughs) Just the Morrissey DJ collective? Plenty plenty to choose from. (laughs) So we started a little crew because like all the, the different styles of music that we play, when you sort of connect us all together, that creates a vibe, you know, like a, a little sort of journey through music. So a vibe? A wee vibe, I am, yeah. <laughs> wee vibe. So I don't know, watch this space. Well, what's your DJ name? Well, we've actually got until tonight to come up with a name. So we're all in an email thread together and I've just been following this weird line of thought. Uh, all right, what do we got? <laughs> right. Um, we'll decide the, this right I now. I have the Cosmic People's Liberation Party. Please comment <laughs> to let us know which of these names you want to hear. They're really, they're very, they're all very similar. It's something basically to do with space communism. It's essentially like what I'm coming up with, you know? Yeah. So, so what's been going on with you, Sam? How are you doing? I'm good. I actually feel like I haven't been myself lately. I've been sleeping in a lot and not going out on the weekends for a change. Um, just resting up for like the crazy, hectic festival season that we have planned. So just trying to get my shut eye whenever I can. Well, Sam, you're jumping on a plane and going to Mexico pretty soon. Yeah, it's going to be my first time. I'm super excited. I've heard nothing but great things. The vibe of Mexico City is just really taking off. There's a lot of uh, exciting local talent that I'm ready to dig into. Mexico just has a really vibrant techno um, and underground scene. Uh, Robaledo is is someone that I've uh, really wanted to check out. He's one half of Pachanga Boys and they run their hippie dance label. So that's going to be uh, exceptional. Maceo Plex, who hasn't really played uh, an Insomniac show in quite some time. So I'm excited to see what he has lined up. Uh, I believe the last time I saw him was for his mosaic party in Amsterdam. So I was at that. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Perfect. He's a beast, dude. He's yeah, so good. Yeah. yeah, it's just unfair how good he is, honestly. But you'll have to report back on that set in Mexico because it'll. I wonder if he's going to go cater off. to it differently. I mean, we got a, a, a bunch of firsts in Mexico, too. I mean, it'd be Eric Prids' first time not just playing EDC Mexico, but playing the entire country for the first time. He's never played Mexico. And uh, 
if you caught the Parliament Art Car at EDC Vegas last year, that'll be making its first appearance outside of Vegas at any show we've ever done. So Parliament Art Car will be there. And after Mexico, we're all kind of jetting over to Asia for EDC China and EDC Japan, which should be amazing. Our first time in China and our second time in Japan. Oh, look at those lineups. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's there's actually a lot going on uh, in Japan. We have uh, people like Above and Beyond, Martin Garrix, Steve Aoki, uh, Rez, Floster um Diplo. Just Jeez essentially a little almighty. bit for everyone. Costumes will be good in Japan. Outfits. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. That's something that uh, that it took a while to introduce into Mexico, but now we got a lot of outfits coming out there too. So I'm sure really? that'll. Do they have like rave attire or is it just normal core? It's just festive in general, I think. There's a love of trinkets and little little things. Yes. There's a word in Japanese, I don't know what it is, but I know that there's a word for a, a, a small piece of decorational toy memorabilia that serves no purpose. Like that's what, it's a word to describe this one specific thing. So I think the idea of candy could be very easily translated. Yeah. Oh, cool. Someone else who is playing EDC Japan is actually our guest this month, Alice in Wonderland. Yes, she is. I actually saw Alice in Wonderland like three years ago at the Mixmag Lab at the CNN Tower off Sunset Boulevard. It was amazing. As that was a daytime was going thing, right? Was, yeah. yeah, that was beautiful. I remember yeah, it was seeing as that. the sun was going down. It was incredible. Like, and that video has got like almost like nine million views. I think it's the most watched one on Mixmag's entire channel, right? But I remember she finished with this absolutely incredible sequence of tracks, right? Listen to this. Bill Withers, Ain't No Sunshine, Into Massive Attack Teardrop, Into Cypress Hill, I Want to Get High, Into Jamie XX, There's Gonna Be Good Times, Into The Cure, Close To Me, Into Beastie Boys, Intergalactic, Fat Boy Slim, Praise You. The whole ending sequence of her I set. want a medley of just it that was, bit. It was incredible. I listened to it on the way over here because I was like, oh, what were the songs that she was playing again? Unbelievable. She's so talented. Welcome to Wide Awake Stories. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Of course. The first thing you ever did for us, you shared with us a story of the night you fell in love with dance music. Yes. Which was a great story. Talking about the knife and the, yeah, I remember. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that also the night that you realized this is what I'm going to do? Like forever because sometimes those nights aren't mutually exclusive i gotta tell you it's a really funny thing because i was speaking about it recently i've just wrapped up my second album and you know i've just been given so many opportunities and obviously this is my one and only career now but at the time when i fell in love with electronic music i mean i've always been a musician and, and i just needed an outlet so i was doing it because it was the one thing that was giving me enjoyment i actually had no clue that number one you could make anything out of it or anyone would really, you know, listen to it. I was literally just locked in a room doing it because it was making me happy. And secondly, I didn't realize that electronic music production was connected with, you know, you could DJ as well and, and those two kind of worked with each other, even though I feel like they're completely different things. But yeah, it was really crazy. I, I've never been one to be like, I'm gonna make it. It was never like that. The only reason I started making electronic music was to keep myself sane and happy and I, again, like this, this just like, like weirds me out so much. If I if I went back in time and told myself that this is what I would be doing right now, and I could actually like make something out of it, I'd be in disbelief because I was happy living in a tiny little shoebox apartment, making electronic music, making DJ money off the side. That that was that's what I kind of just thought was going to happen. So, do you remember though that moment that you first felt almost a sense of responsibility to this? bigger thing that has kind of swept you up for me like uh just being really in touch with how i feel emotionally is like the thing that keeps me going when i meet my fans and they say i help them through you know um depression or, or stop their friend from committing suicide um that really hits me hard and, and that's what i feel like is important to do is to not let people down that do um, you know turn to artists or, or something t to hear something real and honest I think in electronic music I have brought a voice uh, which is you know I, I write songs so lyrically what I'm writing is my diary and people are listening to that and they're realizing that you know they're not the only people that are going through stuff and that it does get better and it is something that I've taken time out of you know 
what what I make to to relay. This is like a, a message that I love to um, put out there: is that you're not alone, and we we can do this all together. And that's the the one thing I love about electronic music is it's a whole big community, and people are really there for each other. And I feel like it doesn't matter if you're like a a geek or an athlete or an outcast or or a nerd or or whatever or a jock. Like no one really cares. You know, it's all about the music. It's all about being there and and feeling like that. And I think it's it's a very beautiful thing in electronic music. I feel like not many scenes have that. And um, you know, I, that kind of keeps me going, and and it makes me feel proud of the scene that I'm in. I really, really like have amazing fans, and and I've met so many incredible people through that. And it does, it does help me to keep going, not in terms of like having a responsibility, but but knowing that people are listening and and that they they are like really responding to what I'm trying to communicate. Like that keeps me going. That shit keeps me going. My fans, like sometimes I want to. I want to give everything up. Like when I was writing this new album, I was, I was, ugh, God, like I, I went crazy. I was like kicking doors. I was like crying. Like I literally went crazy like quite a few times, and and I, I, I felt like giving up. And then uh, you know, like I just see one thing where someone was like, you know, you're the reason like I started producing, or you're the reason that like I went and spoke to my friend when I was feeling depressed, and and it really like made me not embarrassed. That's what I was going to ask you next because. Uh, Electronic music at some point in time became very like persona based, right? It didn't yeah. used to be like that a long time ago. I mean, there were there were personalities, but personas, all that stuff is is kind of a relatively new thing. And then when when in conjunction with social media, it's almost like the match and the gasoline. Like so, you have people who want to have these personas, and then they those personas are given like fuel mm -hmm. by social media yeah you almost have the exact eye like there's the, no it's persona the, it's the exact opposite. At all. what you see online is exactly what you get so i was speaking to my friend leader recently mm. and i was showing him my album and i was freaking out and i was like you know like is this bad is it good and he just looked at me and he's like oh, you know like you might hate that i'm about to say this but with whatever you've ever done and the years that i've known you you've always been unapologetically yourself on and off music or camera or you know whatever it may be and like that's a blessing and a curse because people really you know know your everything that you're going through at all time and I, yeah. and and yeah so when I started like tweeting um, I had no followers and I, I'd had followers on Instagram and, and Facebook and stuff and I you know I, I treated that as a certain type of outlet for myself and and honestly like being being able to limit my thoughts into like a small amount of letters helped me write lyrics weirdly enough because it helped me learn how to to be so direct with what I was trying to say so I, w I would literally like you know 10 or 20 times a day just tweet exactly what I was thinking and and that became like a thing and, and my Twitter started growing and, and I just didn't really change that and and I'll have to go back to your Twitter to look for the song lyrics <laughs> for the new record. <laughs> I mean, you'll know that I went through a hard time doing this, but yeah, you know, like nothing's ever been held back. Every heartbreak, every time I've had felt lows, every time I felt highs, it's out there. And and you know, it, it, on the side, I'm a lyricist, so every lyric you hear written in any one of my songs comes from me and comes from you know periods where I really went through shit, you know, and um, I just feel like. <sighs> I don't even like to analyze what an artist is, but you know, I would like to be on my deathbed one day knowing that I was the realest I could ever be with my art and with my words and, you know, with myself as an artist. You know, I think when you're when you're up on stage, giving every little piece of you is a very, very amazing um like what's the word? It's a, it's a very, very like not many people get that. Not many people. It's terrifying and fulfilling at the same it's time. It's not even terrifying <laughs> for me. I feel so at ease on stage because I'm literally giving every raw part of myself to people that are giving it back to me. Yeah. And I feel this weird connection that I don't feel at any other time. Like you get me off stage and I'm quiet. I'm standing in the corner. You know, I'm not. I, I'm not very good at parties. I'm not very good at like eye contact really you know well that's what i was gonna ask you like you, you're in la now right yeah 
How, th- that's got to do a number on you. <laughs> it's a very interesting, strange town, especially when you present yourself in a certain way and yeah. the industry is all around you and kind yeah. of circling. Like, has, has, has it been weird being um, in LA? Yeah, and- I don't really like attracting attention to myself off stage. I feel very embarrassed when people come up to me. If it's like a fan, honestly, my fans are the best ever. But when I'm talking about someone in the industry coming up to me and trying to hustle with me, it, it like straight away makes me want to walk off because yeah. I just like I can't deal with networking I've never been good <laughs> at it I've never been good at it the connections I've ever made have been so organic it's been you know kind of drunk on a couch at 3am probably hating the same thing you yeah. know and that's when a conversation strikes up for me that's when I get to know a person I'm very overwhelmed when people come up to me in that setting and they're you know they're tr- they've got a certain agenda because I can sense it are you that way with fans or just no with indi- no, okay. no no I can my fans I'm telling you now I'm so lucky because they are literally the best people in the world every single fan I've ever met of mine is a beautiful human who I think like you attract what you put out you, you mm. attract people who get if you, you know there's going to be some people that hate what I do and that's cool because we're obviously not on the same wavelength, but that's cool because something else will attract them and they'll be on the same wavelength. Yeah. So the people that I attract are on my wavelength I, because I'm putting out like the real me. You There's know? a girl who I've met who goes to our shows who named Janelle. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who you, she, I'm sure you totally know. She, she's she. I actually give her tickets to a lot of my shows. Well, I, I kind of, because I knew her and because I know you and I see the, the sort of parallels and I see how you'll say something and she'll respond. And it's that very symbiotic relationship that you're talking about where you're putting yourself out there. You're, you're throwing a ball. Someone's catching it. Yeah. And then they're throwing it back at you. And like, that's like a relationship that's like, no, it's, been, and it's now she's producing and, and DJing. No, it's very real. And, like, and you know, if I can give women the, uh, the confidence to go out and do that, like more power to them because like that, that's all I want to see is like, not even women, like anyone who doesn't feel confident seeing like someone who is socially quite awkward and was never like very popular kind of doing this you know it's not a bad thing because i feel like that kind of made me to go and do this because i didn't really have anything else to do but it's so funny to me because when you think about electronic music back in the in the day and i hate to say that but those are the people that got into electronic music in the first place yeah, because exactly. they were mildly antisocial. Yeah. They kept to themselves. They mm-hmm. liked to push buttons and play around and they never wanted to be lead singers or lead guitarists. Oh. So they became electronic musicians and they got to hide behind this and do this. Now it's almost, it's the exact opposite now. I mean, but look, it's almost like you're that same like personality who's like, look, I, I didn't get into this to be up all no, here I, and I do really, that. I really you know? didn't. <laughs> and like, you can ask anyone, all my friends are still my friends from back, you know, I have like five friends, but all of them, <laughs> this is like true. This is, this is not a lie. Like, and all of them have been my friends since way back. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm really... Yeah, well, going back to the the LA scene and, and all the party scene, I'm awkward as fuck unless I'm behind the decks. So if you're at a party with me and you want to find where I'm at, I'm usually hiding next to the dude at the decks <laughs> or near the food. Tell me, yeah, same. <laughs> Tell me about that connection because it's one thing to play and you're playing at a club, you're playing like a moderate sized venue. But when you play a venue or a show like EDC, for instance, yeah, and you get up there and there's all those people out there. Like, do you remember the first time yes, you I played tell- EDC? I, and- yeah, I can tell you all of this. Cause I, <laughs> I literally like EDC is such a crazy festival for me and it's so meaningful. The first time I properly cried on stage was the first time I ever played at EDC. I have to admit, and I said this to Pascal before, you know, because I was quite embarrassed about it. But <laughs> my first show in, this, in America was Coachella. And my second big show kind of like that, or I'm sorry guys, someone's going to correct me on this, I'm sure. But one of my second ones were, it was just after I did my Mix Mag set was EDC. And I had, I had never heard of EDC. I didn't know what it was. I just was like, all right, cool. You know, and I hadn't seen the stage. I hadn't Googled it. I literally had no idea what I was about to get into. You just showed up and- I just showed up and I, I hadn't even prepared a set, nothing. And I, I, you know, I was improvising. Well, that's refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, you know, there's sometimes you do have to prepare a set because you've got, you know, especially with an album, you want to coordinate visuals yeah, and course. stuff. But then, you know, like in other times when I'm, you know, Mix Mag wasn't planned either. So Mix Mag was improvised, um, you know, but then Coachella, I did plan a little bit more because 
I had other things. And that was twenty fifteen, right? Twenty fifteen, yeah. yeah. So I turn up to EDC and I'm playing my set and I'm looking out there and I I'm not even kidding, I blacked out for a second and I went back to my my I, I'm telling you now, I've never seen anything like it. And I, I'll never forget my what my eyes saw as soon as I walked up on stage because I, I genuinely had never seen that many people in front of me. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Did I just say yes to like, w- what are these people going to think of my music? Like I was so nervous and, and I got up and I, I just like, as, as soon as I started, the music started playing, I was, you know, in my zone and mm-hmm. I was cool. But, um, you know, I, I, I like had this like break of consciousness again. I looked out and I saw these people and I closed my eyes again. I'll never forget it. Like I, I, I like literally saw myself back in my bedroom and I, and I got up on the thing and, and I, I think it's like recorded somewhere, but I, I literally just screamed, started from my bedroom and now I'm here and I, and I started crying because it was just like, I will never take any opportunity. Like even if it's like playing to a hundred people ever for granted, like I'm always appreciative if even one person's listening to my shit or like watching me DJ. Yeah. And I was just like, whoa, like I, I can't believe this doesn't. This isn't real. Like I, I, I'm telling you now, it was the craziest shit. Fast forward to 2016, I'm playing on main stage at EDC, and you know I'd done Orlando and you know a few other things now for Insomniac, and kind of like understood what a big kind of rave in in the USA was like now, which is super magical. And uh, I got up, and I'll, I, I, if anyone ever has a chance to check the video up on YouTube of me getting up on stage and playing EDC 2016, you will laugh because um, I I don't know if anyone's seen Gladiator, but getting up there and seeing the crowd. So there's this thing where I do, if I haven't played a place, I don't like to see what it looks like before I get up on stage. Because for me, like the adrenaline just fucking drives me. So I get up on stage and I'm like, yo, what the fuck this shit looks like the CGI crowd from Gladiator. <laughs> What is, are you not entertained? No, I really, really, <laughs> really felt like it looked like a sea. It did not look real. Like that many people can't be there. Like it's just not real. It was literally a sea of people. Yeah. I was seeing like, I was seeing like, um, you know, the cardboard cutouts of my face and yeah. like, you know, logos of mine and my name and like my mum was there. So like she got to see it and she was just like, what the hell? And if you look at the video, I start at the beginning when I start my intro, I, I got pins and needles in my hands from just being in disbelief and I couldn't feel my fingers oh, and shit. to be able to mix um, you need your hands yes true so I was like shit 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 so you see me up there just like breathing and just shaking my hands back and forth in this really weird dance and that's literally me trying to get feeling, feeling back in my back hands because <laughs> it was just like the most el- overwhelming um, sight really and like when people are responding to you at that point big of a capacity like it feels like this wave like this physical wave of energy getting thrown at you like a hadouken (laughs) you know but i'm just saying like there's never a high i feel ever or can or will ever try and find which is next to or close to being on stage and and having playing a set where the crowd and you are so connected it literally feels like you're not here I'm curious to know from you, and I, I'm going to choose my use my words wisely. I know you're going to bring up the female DJ thing. No, no, no. Okay. It's, it's your opinion on something. Okay. When you got booked to to spin a gig, mm. it wasn't because you produced a lot of tracks. Yeah. It was because you were a great fucking DJ. Well, right? this is the thing. When I now started, now it's a little bit different because yeah. you're ninety percent of the people who get booked get booked on the on the strength on of the, their the music. original music. See, I, I was lucky in a way where when I started DJing. I was getting booked as a DJ and I was doing six nights a week in like an, in underground clubs in Sydney and I gained a following as a DJ, okay? And so in Australia, I had like, um, you know, I kept doing me. At the time, you know, I was a little bit of a lone wolf because I wasn't really mixing the same way other people were doing it because I didn't really Google what other people were doing or like I didn't have like a like anything to, to look back on because I wasn't like a super DJ, like stalker of other... <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, Not train spotting all the time. No, the I wasn't. You know, yeah. like I was, I was really just in my own thing, and I was like really excited about 
putting two tracks together and seeing how they would sound and, you know, getting an instrumental with drums. And, and I, you know, like that's how I was DJing. And I was doing like, I was talking to my sister about it the other day, like it was hours and hours and then coming home and producing. And I think I said this earlier, like I never really realized that DJing and production were, um, were uh, like connected. But at the same time, I put in the hard yards. I was like, there was one year I did like 200 gigs in a year for rural in rural towns in Australia and stayed in pubs and like was just you know doing my thing but like it it was like a hard slog yeah. and 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 again like you know I I I don't know I'm known for wearing oversized t-shirts and stuff like that and I did that because I never wanted it to be anything but the music I was playing and yeah. I, you know I still do that but and yeah. you laid the foundation beforehand yeah. and then when when it became about production and producing tracks when it like, became oh, about production check it no, it was weird I'm, because pe- I was producing under a different name. I'm telling you now, like, it's the weirdest fate ever <laughs> because, like, this is not, like, a normal story. I was producing under a different name and no one knew it was... And, like, my DJ name back then was Alice in Wonderland, but I was producing under the name White Fang and I was, like, making stuff in my bedroom. This is, like, 2009. And uh, a guy at the local underground radio station heard it and started playing it and then Radio 1 picked it up and played it a couple of times and and my manager who's my best friend was like whoa have you heard this chick White Fang like she sounds like you and I was like it's me actually Surprise. yeah and so I ended up getting signed as Allison Wonderland in 2011 actually but still rejected like no one was coming to meetings or anything just um I think someone was like, oh, a girl DJ, let's sign her, right? And it was never thought anything more of. And then I think they realized that they heard all my production from White Fang and they were like, oh, why don't you bring that over like to your DJ name and not separate them? And that's when I started like, you know, really um, like kind of killing off White Fang a little bit and making that Alice in Wonderland. I mean, like I'm probably going to make some more White Fang stuff and stick it up because why not? But like, you know, it was a lot more industrial, like Nine Inch Nails meets Sleigh Bells kind of shit. It was, you know, but um, they, they, I guess they realized that. And so, but, but then like, you know, <laughs> no one was really understanding what I was doing. Like I, I remember getting emails back from like the big, radio station over there being like oh she can't really like this would be tight like if her voice wasn't on it or like I don't think these beats are like and I was doing like future BT stuff back then because I was really into like southern hip hop and I really wanted to like copy what Lil Wayne was doing and stuff like that but make like emotional electronic synths so it was like you know that's how I started making like future beats and um, I I remember just getting rejected over and over again and um one day I well I just kept doing my thing and then one day I guess it clicked and then it happened very quickly does that make sense like it was a very slow very slow climb and then all of a sudden I'm playing Coachella and it's fucking crazy I am I'm gonna be playing Coachella again the new album will be out well let's talk about that yeah I definitely want to talk about the new record it's super exciting because uh, I really feel a strong sense of ownership over this album in terms of like the spirit of it the sounds the lyrics you know it's my baby it's called awake and there's like some really experimental beatsy shit in there and then there's some songs and I, I I didn't ever know if they would work together and then I put all the songs together and I was like, holy shit, this isn't a fucking album. Yes. You know, and I've got like, a, I've got ballads on there and then I have, you know, like breakbeat track on there and some really like heavy, like fucked up shit where I'm like screaming and it turns into a grime beat. And then I have pop songs and like, you know, no one should be shocked that I say that because if you are like a fan of my music, you know that like my last album run, it's pop songs like with electronic music behind it so it's you know for me it's like a it's like basically the next evolution of it's like an evolved pokemon you know it's the next evolution of my music and uh you know i was fortunate enough to write with some very amazing people on this album i wrote with a guy called joel little who did uh lord's pure heroine um he did khalid um he's amazing and you know i'd never really written with other people in terms of songs. So, you know, I'd come, I'd come to him with my songs and he'd be like, instead of being really invasive, 
he'd just be so empathetic to what I'd written and he'd be like hey why don't you just like make that a triplet or like put this note over here and it would raise like you know just like fine tuning he reminds me a little bit of the Rick Rubin approach where it's like I'm not going to come in and lie all over no, your tracks do do that. it's more about and I getting let into anyone what's do that. here I'm too and stubborn. like talking and discussing yeah you know? And like, I, I don't want anyone to do that. It needs to feel like my songs. And you know, I'm very, very like, I feel very possessive over my lyrics and my melodies. So to have someone like that come in and raise it in like a non-invasive way was probably like the best collaboration I could have had. And like, he was so chill and I'm so crazy. And like, just like I was able to tell him what I was going through at the time. And there's no judgment. And you know, it's also good to have someone to, you know, talk to. So, you know, that was good. And it helped me like, push myself as a writer in terms of production um i did a lot of it myself like a lot of it um more than i realized you know and then i had like uh i worked a little bit with elangelo he did like a bridge for one of my tracks so like you know you know like the bridge before the end he worked on that elangelo did like the weekend um he did all the weekend stuff he's an amazing guy i fucking love him you know i did a couple of things with lido who's one of my best friends we've worked on music before um you know uh I'm trying to think and do you still have that same approach where being in the studio and vibing one off one i know sometimes you have to send stems no i can't do that you don't do that i can't do yeah, that i, I know I don't. you didn't do it on the first record but yeah i don't believe in that i really really don't believe in that like i think i need to fucking feel like the spirit of the god it's like such a hippie i'm not <laughs> but you know and like if you're going to collaborate on music with someone you guys need to know each other and be like at your rawest point to be able to get through and like there's some sessions and i think uh, leader did an interview about this where like we'd go in and we'd just talk to the point where we were at our rawest so we were ready to like go in on something and you know there's a couple of tracks we made which didn't make the album but i think i want to release them anyway i did like one thing over skype but the song was already done and it was for a feature but the two other features i have on my album i was in the room like in there with them like really going at it like really really getting in on like what they were feeling like for me like as a producer as opposed to a songwriter like if i'm working with another artist i need to be getting out of them real shit i and so like i worked with chief keef on this i worked with trippy red on this and then i worked with a guy called buddy so buddy worked on one of the tracks with me he's sick so he just released a ep like last year yeah. Trinata did all the beats for it he signed to pharrell's label he's like insane mm -hmm. In, in regards to Chief Keef and Trippy Red, like I was in the studio with them. What experiences I had, I don't know if I'm allowed to speak about because I literally, I mean, working with rappers is amazing because it's fascinating and I'm such a fucking nerd. <laughs> like I, I like really am not cool. Like I think, so Chief Keef was walking in and he, he said he was going to do like four lines on this track and I'd had like, I'd made like 20 trap beats and I was going through them and he didn't really vibe with any. And then there's this like break beat with like an emotional synth over it. And he like really wanted to jump on that. And he ended up singing two verses and a chorus and like really like staying with us for like four hours, like really in his feels. And it's honestly one of the best Chief Keef verses I've ever heard in my life. Cause it's like quite deep and, uh, my manager, who's like the most Australian dude ever, like walks in, he's like, Oi, mate, you know you've got your car on, the lights are on, and the door's open. And Chief Keefe's like sitting there drinking something from a cup and like looks up in the booth, and I'm like chilling in the booth with him, and he's like, I know. Right. And then just keeps, he's like, again, and says to the engineer, again, and keeps playing it over and over again. And, and then, God, no rules. No rules. No like rules. the guy's like, lights were on in his car and the car was open. He was just like, the cool. And I was like, I wish I was that cool. But I would be like, too conscious about my battery and like the environment. I'm double parked. Am I double parked? Like, what if someone can't get past like the doors being open? Like, no, nah, but it was cool. And, and we actually got on because I think it was from such different worlds. There was no like, trying to like be cool in front of each other and same thing with trippy red trippy red was amazing to work with and that song to me is like really special because i made the instrumental to that on a plane and it wasn't supposed to be on the album and he heard it and resonated with him and pretty crazy i'm gonna ask you a weird random musical influence okay. question i could be totally off yeah. base but do you have a love for Susie and the banshees yeah okay vocally yes <laughs> 
yeah. I, I'm like, I really love like the dirty projectors as well. I'm the first to admit I ain't a singer, but um, you know, like I wrote the lyrics and I'm gonna go in and sing them as best as I can, like with the most meaning. And hey, like if I'm clumsy on some things, I'm clumsy, but like, I like that. All right, last thing I'm gonna do is speed round. Okay. Tootsie Roll Pops or Blow Pops? I, a Tootsie Roll Pop, because I don't know what a Blow Pop is. <laughs> Sour Patch Kids or Gummy Bears? Gummy Bears. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Black licorice or nah? Black. Fish, it's like one of my favorites. And uh, what is your one go-to record that's like comfort food for you? The one album you put it on and you know like, I need something right now. I've got like three of them. All right, hit me. What are they? Um, I've got uh, Silent Shout by The Knife. And then I have, um, it's like a Fugazi record that I have, which is like, an old punk band and it's like a demos record which I put on and then um, you guys can't laugh at me but it's the Lana Del Rey album what's the one where she's standing with the blue wait it's on my iPhone I actually have my go-to records but then I've also got the Beatles and the Beastie Boys um, like Paul's Boutique's one you can't do this to me because <laughs> I'm like in so there's like this band called Sleep that I love Smashing Pumpkin Siamese Dream great album I don't know I fucking hate myself. Prodigy, music for the Delta generation. I'm just, yeah, I, I need to find what this Lana track, I want to make sure I've got the right album. Born to Die, yeah. Ready to Die by yeah. I got that summertime, summertime sadness. It's so sick. She's sick. I love her. I want to be her friend. Broadcasting from the Insomniac HQ. This is Wide Awake Stories. She's such an amazing personality. Uh, the thing that really resonated with me is how she's kind of living this uh, life in the spotlight, but she's very socially awkward. And that's something that I can deeply connect to, just like not being able to be the best conversationalist and always tripping over my own tongue. Yeah, it's just very fascinating how someone who's always in the spotlight might not want to be there, but is doing it for the passion and just for to have a, a deep connection with her fans. And I think that really comes to life in her music. Yeah, it's super genuine, man. Like, I think what I was saying in the interview about not just DJ culture today, but DJ culture plus social media, if anything, it seems like a place where you would go to put on a persona, to maybe hide being a little bit more socially awkward. But she kind of flips it and she completely embraces it and she uses social media not to promote this false image of herself, but to promote who she is, warts and all. And that's not something a lot of people do, let alone uh, th that a woman would do. Yeah, she really rocks it on stage. Just from looking at her, I don't think you'd be able to tell that she has that uh, insecurity. She just always oh, she's just owning beast it. on stage. She's in the zone. Yeah, and she really has that combination of stage presence, but she's got the artist catalog to back it up. I mean, I remember 10, 15 years ago, if you wanted to get booked at a show and play a rave, you were booked on your skills as a DJ, not necessarily on the tracks you produced. And she talked about that in the interview where she was kind of on the cusp and she was putting stuff out as a producer, but she was also getting booked in Australia on just the power for DJing. But these days, you get booked on the power of your original compositions, on the power of your productions. And I think, to be honest, that might be a reason why we don't see a lot more female DJs booked at festivals. Well, I think it is true that producers are being forced to DJ because mm -hmm. people hear a song, they fall in love with it, and they're like, oh man, when is this person playing? And a lot of people are now forced into the, I gotta be a song and dance person, I have to do both. Um, but in terms of more female producers, I mean, I just don't know why there aren't more female producers being booked because they're out there. Yeah. And the female DJs are out there. Um, I just think maybe there are more females being booked for underground stuff, not the larger, more, I don't want to say mainstream, but just larger scale production festivals. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, we're guilty of it too from time to time. Um, I know that everybody's hearts are in the right place and that they want to amend that. They want to fix it. We want to see more females. It just hasn't really done a 180 yet 
Why well, do you think that is, Ross? Well, I mean, this conversation has been, as, as Deirdre mentioned, this conversation has been going on in the underground for a, a long couple, time. Of, couple of years now. We've been having it out in the open. You know, you've got people like the Black Madonna, who's been a huge sort of spokesperson for this, Disc Woman, an all-female um, collective and booking agency, who have done, a, a, you know, a really, really incredible job of raising awareness around these issues. There was a Tumblr that ran a little while ago that called out, like, um, lineups that were completely male-heavy. You know, so this is this is some, a conversation that's been happening, but it's really like starting to have an effect on the booking of, of festivals now and, and for club shows. Like, I remember, I can't, I, I, I wish I could remember off the top of my head which festivals it was in the UK last year, but they, they really are getting closer. You know, we're talking like 30% females on the acts with goals of getting to 50, you know, and like really like we are actually making some progress on the underground. Ross, I think one of the reasons why that barrier isn't as great in the underground world and in the in the techno world is because I think historically you've had a lot more female producers in that genre who are kind of lauded and critically acclaimed and play more in Europe. I I mean, yes, maybe to an extent, yeah. But I, I mean, a large part of it was is us deciding that we needed to have this conversation mm. and then starting to put the pressure on the promoters, on the booking agents, on the industry to change this stuff, you know, to start creating platforms, you know, within the industry that uh, that can elevate people up and, and, and really level the playing field. I mean, I, I think like a lot of people in in, um, in in more mainstream genres of dance music, like as it's kind of surged in popularity in America in the last like, what, six years since like 2012, it came in with like dubstep was the wave that brought a lot of people in. It's quite a masculine kind of, I don't want to, I don't want to say bro -y, but it is quite an aggressive sort of genre of music, you know? And you, you might still be feeling the effects of that wave that brought this latest group of fans in might be a sort of quite a strongly male dominated sound genre. It's interesting know? that you bring that up because to me, the the benefit, and it's kind of a weird benefit, but, the, but one of the hugest benefits to me to seeing more female DJs perform on stage is the way that energy translates back into the crowd. And it's just something different and it's hard to quantify, but when you've got a woman up there who's throwing down and making the crowd go insane, like you see it when Rez plays our shows. It, it, uh, something changes in the crowd. There's an element of the crowd that changes that's just cosmically different when there's a woman up there blowing it up and rocking the crowd and when there's a man up there. It's just, it's just something I feel as a member of the crowd. Do you feel that's because... It's a unique thing? Yes, because it's so rare that it strikes people as being something different. And I mean... I mean, that could be the music. That could be that she's a woman. It could be a, a number of things, but... At least the combination is there. I'm curious to know from people like Icon Collective, who has become more and more a breeding ground for talent that actually gets elevated, what percentage of Icon Collective students are female versus male? Because that's really where you're coming in the door these days. Bedroom producing is great, but I mean, we've seen the success of oh, Slander, Nightmare, Jaws, yeah, there Ghastly. You, go, you know, you know, I'd be curious to know what percentage of people coming through that sort of matriculation process are female too. Because maybe that's where we need to start implementing some change too, in, in those types of areas. 100%, definitely. Yeah, I don't know what the exact number is, but I have a few female friends who are currently going to Icon. Um, Leah Culver's one, and she just uh, collaborated on an Insomniac Records track uh, that rec recently came out with Yoltron. Um, so it is happening, I just don't think it's at the rate that it needs to be quite yet. Well, that's positive. It is happening. It's, going in the right direction for sure. it's all happening. Black Girls Code is an organization that was started to get more interest in the African American, female African American communities into coding. And it's become a huge success. I mean, maybe we need something like that installed in, in at the ground floor of the, of the dance music machine. I mean, that would be really positive, and it certainly couldn't hurt. All, all, of, all of these things are, are great, great suggestions. Ideas. <laughs> no, it's all great ideas. And I think we're certainly seeing more positive reactions to females wanting to, you know, I don't want to say outshine, but I mean, you know, women are, are going for it and they're being encouraged to go for it. And they're, I would say they're being met with less public resistance than previously. That's not to say we don't have further to go. We don't necessarily have an all around solution because there are so many factors that go into creating roadblocks but i mean at least we're talking about it for sure not that i want to pat ourselves on the back too much 
but <laughs> at least at least a star. at right. least we're, we're recognizing right. it and we want to encourage people to realize that this is weird that it's weird that lineups are only 10% female that's weird it's not because there's a lack of talent I mean, we know you guys have a lot of feelings on this topic too. Feel free to join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Wide Awake Stories. We'll be back next year to count everyone on the lineup, all right? <laughs> one by one. That's our show for this month. If you are going to Mexico, look for Sam. He'll have his Wide Awake Stories shirt on Ooh. and his Wide Awake mic, and he'll be looking for y'all. And if anyone's making the trip out to Japan or China, <laughs> We will see you out there too. Until next month, y'all. Oh, Thanks for tuning in. Peace. Thank you. Later. Tune in next month for a new episode of Wide Awake Stories.